I'd say it's because of how easily it could become infected and how long it can be infected without us even noticing, without re even realizing, and the impact that has systemically for the whole body. Um, so, you know, chronic inflammation of the gums, even according to mainstream, it's been, you know, shown it can potentially contribute to cardiovascular disease, diabetes, uh, respiratory tract diseases, um, even uh, adverse pregnancy outcomes, you know, miscarriage and stuff like that. I mean, it, it's serious stuff. And I mean, that's like the, the, the what's the word, the Google list, but I'd, I'd, you know, spread it to way more broadly that, than that. I'd spread it to all kinds of area, any kind of infection, sinus infection, ear infection, especially because it's all the ear, mouth and throat are all, you know, uh, the same kind of area, um, uh, SIBO, SIBO, all of those kind of gastrointestinal issues, like like it does, it goes on and on and on and on, and it can all start with this innocent little infection that you don't even realise is there, and you don't even feel any discomfort, or maybe you only feel it when you floss, and therefore you don't floss, Or, but, you know, it's like, a, uh, it could be something you can get away with ignoring for decades. <laughs> Hello and welcome to the Rejuvenate Podcast. I'm your host, Chrissy Hawks, and I am here with my co-host, Ellen Robinson. And today we are talking oral care and gum health. So Ellen, tell me, why did you choose this topic? Why are we talking about this topic today? Uh, first of all, as you know, Chrissy, we've only just, we, we got quite ahead on episodes before we start releasing them. So we've only just started releasing them recently and it's, <laughs> so far, it's the most requested episode. Um, so giving the people what they want. Uh, but it is a very important topic, as we'll get into. Often it is actually the Achilles heel of a lot of people's health, and that's actually true going back a long time. So whereas a lot of chronic diseases that we've talked about are relatively new in terms of how common they are, oral health has always been a problem for humanity, at least you know back as long as we've had civilization um, and we've had a you know possibly unnatural diet and maybe even way before that. So uh, yeah, it's an important topic. Um, when, and it's something that I find that just like with everything, there's a lot of misunderstanding around it. So, uh, you know, cause I won't bother speaking about a topic that I feel like the mainstream already educates people accurately and adequately on. But yeah, I feel like, uh, even though I'm gonna agree with the mainstream on some points as we'll go over, there's still some fundamental misunderstandings. I'll be honest, Christy, I never thought I would do an episode on oral health. Um, one of the first YouTube videos I ever did, I had someone making fun of my teeth. Um, I'm English, as uh, <laughs> viewers can probably tell, and you know we're famous for having poor oral health, uh, especially by Americans. Um, Americans like to make fun of the British teeth. And I have to acknowledge, my teeth are not in great shape. So who, in a, who on earth am I to speak about this? Well, my teeth are not in great shape because um, I started smoking when I was 13 um, and I did very chronically until I was about 27, 28. And I used to drink loads of coffee um, and I used to consume loads of sugar and worst of all, on top of all of those things, I barely even brushed my teeth. So I did literally, you know, like the worst possible combination from any even normal mainstream point of view of what would be required for oral health. And I was in a in lucky position to be unhealthy in general, which counts, as we'll talk about. And um, I also had very crowded teeth. So I had, I used to have vampire teeth. You can see it in some of my old videos where literally the incisors there were right in front of the other teeth. And so what that meant is that that space between them, it is literally impossible to clean. That's what everyone told me. So it's a site of chronic infection and inflammation and all the rest of it. So I, and my mouth has been a breeding ground of uh, uh, disease and uh, toxicity for most of my early life. And, you know, uh, just, went to see a dentist a couple of days ago and he said to me i've actually never seen someone with gum disease um who's come in as a new client who's like completely 
uh, got it in remission, you know, has like no sign of any active uh, inflammation or bleeding or anything like that. He may have been exaggerating, uh, but still, I mean, I've seen a few over the years and generally they are quite surprised because it's fairly unusual to get it under control so well. So I speak to you not as a person who has optimal health in this area, but more as someone who had abysmal health. One of the reasons I quit smoking um, is around that time, about 27, I went to a dentist and they told me, if you don't stop soon, your teeth are going to fall out because you've already got a lot of gum disease. Your gums already receded a lot. You've already had a lot of bone loss and they're already starting to get loose. And I was like, wow, because you hear, you know, smoking's this, smoking's that, but you can always like kid yourself, ah, it won't happen to me. I won't get lung cancer or whatever, right? But in this case, it's like, no, no, your teeth are almost falling out. Like it, it's happening. This is not a maybe. And so that was one of the things that really shocked me into um, uh, quitting smoking. So uh, I, I'm someone who's recovered from that position enough um, to be in that position. And so, you know, again, I guess it's like someone who used to be 500 pounds and now is 250. Um, they may not be your ideal weight, but they're certainly a lot better than they were before. <laughs> so because of that, I figured, okay, yeah, I can talk about it. I can, I can share what I've learned as a, you know, through the process of, first of all, overcoming that and resolving it as best I can. But also second of all, like, as I always try and do, really understanding the root cause of, so for me, it's kind of obvious why it went wrong, but um, you know, it isn't always so obvious. A lot of people might be watching and say, that's not me, Owen. I brush my teeth religiously and all the rest of it, and I still have these problems. So, yeah, I wanted to address that. Wonderful. I, I, you know, it's one of those things that teeth, gosh, you know, they, especially as we age, they can bring on a lot of very, you know, costly charges from our beautiful, wonderful dentist to keep everything going. So I'm glad we are doing this mm. because I know that that's, you know, can be a complaint along the way. But before we get into the further parts that we're going to discuss, can you just give us a brief overview really of what oral health is and, you know, why it's so important? Yeah. So with oral health, we're talking about the uh, mouth, the gums, and the teeth. They're all interrelated. I will be commenting on all three, but then maybe as we go on later, I'll talk about you know each individually because obviously how to resolve the gums is not the same as the teeth, although there is a lot of overlap. Uh, but yeah, we're talking about all those three. Why is it so important? A uh, couple of reasons. First of all, as I've talked about in previous episode, uh, one thing that can really ruin everything is when you have a chronic infection lying in your body somewhere the chronic infections tend to be areas that are technically outside the body which you know we talked about before that's the lungs and the sinuses and the nasal tract um and and you know a few other places but the biggest area that's technically outside the body is the whole digestive tract that starts with the mouth when i say technically outside the body i mean it's not penetrated into that layer where there is blood right so the immune system treats it as if it's outside the body so any inf chronic infection inside the body is a very serious thing and the body will deal with it, like as in inside from the immune system's point of view. It's in your, if it's in your mouth, it's technically outside your body. Uh, it's, you know, the body treats it similarly as if you had a chronic infection in your skin, but it's not quite the same as the skin. Like the, the body does recognize that it is more internal than the skin. And so when you have that infection that is not dealt with, it puts the immune system on high alert. So whenever there is chronic infection, there is chronic inflammation. And wherever we find chronic inflammation um, for a long time in one part of the body, we're much more likely to find it in other parts of the body. And then there's also the theory that says that has some degree of truth that when the immune system has to deal with that, then it starts to be dysregulated. The regulatory elements of it become imbalanced with the... Uh, pro-inflammatory parts and so then again maybe the immune system doesn't function as well as it should then when we're talking about chronic infection there's always several issues with with infections and one of them is um the impact that the organisms make another one is the response of our immune system but a third is the toxins that the organisms create and so now, if you can think of any worse place to have a constant production of toxicity other than the place that you keep swallowing down into your digestive tract, I'd love to hear it. Maybe it does exist, but it's pretty bad, right? So 
not only have you got all the other stuff going on, but you're, you've got this uh, uh, toxicity factory constantly producing toxicity. And then, you know, unless we're spitting a lot, we're basically swallowing all of it down into our digestive tract. And it's another reason why our digestive tract may uh, suffer. So it's really not a good thing. And because of that, it is associated with all kinds of other, correlated at least, with all kinds of other uh, serious health conditions. And um, so, you know, these days, because the invention of antibiotics, it's not so much the poor oral health will actually kill you directly, although that definitely used to be the case for all our ancestors up until relatively recently, because uh, usually antibiotics can care, care, uh, take care of it. There's the, the fatality rate from oral dental problems is pretty low. Um, but, uh, but there is that concern that all the other stuff I just talked about has an impact on the other systems of the body and can cause a life threatening issue. You've brought up some great points there. So, I, you know, which is going to lead me into, you know, really what does cause poor oral health? Because here we have it where you, you know, if it really is poor oral hygiene uh, and sugary foods that people are eating, you can have an individual that eats pretty healthy and takes really great care of their teeth, but then they are constantly getting cavities or things like that. And somebody on the other side that is, you know, eating all the wrong kind of things, not really brushing, doing very well, and they have no, no cavities. So, can can you, you know, enlighten us on that one? <laughs> That's a good question. It's something I've pondered for a, a long, long time. I remember in like the folklore of my family history, um, when we, when I was around five years old, my family had friends, another couple with a child, and the w there was a wife and the husband, and the wife was like so fanatical about her oral hygiene and brushing her teeth all the time and being careful what she ate and she kept having cavities and then the husband he had apparently not brushed his teeth his entire adult life and he was like in his 40s um, and he would regularly eat honey and all kinds of sugary foods in fact that's kind of all he ate he was not quite a fruitarian but something along those lines and so and he, and he never had any issues ever he had never had one cavity and I always wondered why that is now i know that's anecdotal i'm not saying that's common but even the fact that that's possible right and some of you may know those people who eat whatever they like and they don't have a cavity and it's like why right it's um and so when you ask a, a dentist or a scientist or a doctor that what they'll tend to say is uh one of a couple of things all of which i think may have some merit so the first answer, and this is kind of the go-to answer with uh, scientific professionals these days if they don't know the answer, uh, other than just saying, I don't know, which is a fair answer, but uh, they'll say, oh, it's genetic, right? Now, this is definitely not an answer that I feel is um, ob obviously inadequate because it's one of my things, <laughs> genes, genetic insights. Um, it's absolutely true that our genetics do have a big impact on all kinds of areas of our, our health. And then sure enough, we do actually have reports for the tendency for uh, teeth cavities, um, for the uh, tendency for gum disease and, and various other things. So there is a genetic component with that. However, as far as I understand with those reports, that is, um, they're more correlations. So meaning, um, just like in the case of when we're talking about a syndrome, even though the medical community may not understand exactly what caused it, we can still say people with this SNP and this SNP and this SNP, people with specific genetic variants will tend to have more of a chance or less of a chance to having this issue. So genes play a part, yes, but what part, right? What are they doing? What, what? So that's, so I say, okay, let's dig deeper. <laughs> um, and so the, other thing that's said quite often, which again, I think there's some degree of truth to, although it still doesn't get to a core of it, is about the oral microbiome, right? So we have a microbiome in our digestive tract. What is microbiome? It's uh, basically the combination, it's the ecosystem, the combination of all the different organisms within a certain area. And then those organisms also create something called a biofilm. And a biofilm is something that we have in our mouth and it's something we have throughout our entire digestive tract and 
certainly within our digestive tract, there's such a thing as a good biofilm and a bad biofilm. So there's the good biofilm where there's uh, like a, a certain healthy layer of mucus where good organisms exist and that help to uh, transport nutrients and stuff like that. And then on top of that, generally, it's considered that there's another layer that can form that's called a bad biofilm. And that's where the pathogenic organisms exist and also hide from our immune system. So the biofilm is often uh, a way that it's a it's a strategy it's a technique um that pathogenic or organisms use to actually evade the immune system uh, it's a little bit like they're doing like guerrilla warfare you know they'll come in and hit and then they'll run back to um uh, like hide in foxholes rather than like an open battle so that's uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, the importance of biofilm so anyway so the microbiome is another answer right Maybe, you know, this story of my childhood, this, the husband happened to have a healthy microbiome and the wife didn't. And that's why all the brushing and all the carefulness of the foods that she ate. Again, it's a good answer, but it's not a super helpful answer to me because it's like, well, what do you do with that, right? How do you get a good oral microbiome? I've seen products out there that advertise that they give you uh, like probiotics specifically for oral health, like um, often they're in the form of these little sweets, so they're with sugar alcohols rather than sugar, and um, and you suck on them and you're supposed to, you know, like have some good bacteria. My understanding of those, they may be good if you've had good experience with them, great, but my understanding of them is that just like, unfortunately, the vast majority of probiotic gut supplements, they don't really colonize, they only kind of pass through, and so... Even if they are helpful, you probably have to keep taking them. Like after a year of not taking them, it will have gone back to probably what it was before. As far as I understand, and again, this is evolving science, so maybe we'll discover something else. But as far as I understand, the main benefit of taking the good bacteria is that they actually have an effect of changing the environment to some degree. And they have the effect of quite possibly killing some of the bad organisms to some degree so it's not so much that you're recolonizing it's just that you're changing the terrain by getting rid of some of the bad guys and adding some more good stuff um so okay we can't really change that microbiome very easily at least not just by taking probiotics or something so what else is there to it and miraculously the answer to this question actually came to me from a dentist of all people you never would think uh, <laughs> a dentist would give you no i'm kidding um but they explained that basically the key fact they explained to me that basically the key factor for oral health is the volume of saliva that you have in your mouth and the alkalinity of the saliva that you have in your mouth and so the way they described it is like if your mouth is healthy you're having this constant like fountain of saliva and alkaline minerals that is bathing all of your teeth and gums so why does that matter well because what causes tooth decay what causes gum disease, what causes these, you know, infections, what causes the inflammation. I think most people know what causes that. That's caused by bad bacteria, right? Proliferating. So, okay. So bad bacteria proliferating. Why do bad bacteria proliferate? Generally, the thing that's uh, blamed is sugar and acids. Um, so these bacteria that, these bad bacteria that thrive in the mouth, they are like an acidic environment and they often make the environment more acidic if they proliferate and they feed on sugar. And so the way around it actually works is you eat sugar, you have some in your mouth, the bacteria feed on it, they produce more acidity. That acidity will then bathe your teeth instead of the alkaline mineral bath that should bathe your teeth and the acidity wears away at the enamel of your teeth which is this protective layer of alkaline minerals that is there to protect your teeth from decay from invasion so so that's that's reality that that is the reality but so how is it that some people maybe can eat a bunch of sugar and not brush their teeth and be okay my theory on this is 
if the person is producing enough of a volume of alkaline enough saliva and on an ongoing basis like because the saliva can fluctuate throughout the day if it's alkaline most of the time but then it's high, you know quite acidic for a few hours that's still enough of a chance for the bacteria to then really grow so but if it's constantly a very lubricated very alkaline environment in your mouth then any acidity from any sugar that you ate gets neutralized so it doesn't get a chance to proliferate in the first place so that's my understanding of how that scenario that you just talked about um, is actually possible the other person on the other hand if you if that's not your reality if you don't have an abundance of alkaline saliva constantly bathing your mouth then you have to supplement <laughs> and so what is supplement it's brushing your teeth what do we tend to brush our teeth with we tend to brush our teeth with alkaline constituents right like calcium carbonate is usually one of the uh, the first ingredient main ingredient um some of the other ingredients as well are sugar alcohols, which kill bacteria, like xylitol and erythritol are quite common these days, but you know, sorbitol, which is not a great thing, but it is a thing that kills bacteria. So anything ending with ol, which is a lot of the ingredients in your toothpaste, cal and calcium tend to be some of the main ingredients. So it's things that kill the bacteria, and it's things that alkalize the mouth, right? And so we, because we do not have our own alkaline bath, we are then supplementing um, with that alkaline material every time. And this is where, if you are not in a good place, it maybe does make sense to do that on a very regular basis. You can overbrush your teeth, but you can't really overbathe them in alkaline minerals. That, that seems to be like just a, a pretty beneficial thing. Now, mm, I say that it even depends what alkaline mineral. I guess you could overdo it like baking soda or something like that, but not because it's too alkaline, but because it's, it's a lot of salt, which can dry your mouth. And remember, we want it, the saliva not just to be alkaline, we want it to be voluminous. So we do not want a dry environment. We want a, um, uh, a moist environment in our mouth all the time. And so there's various things that can get away with that. I'll just finish my list and, and then um, I'll open it to questions. So toxins also make a big difference, right? Mercury in the mouth, obviously, uh, can be an issue. I think most people know that these days. Um, be, for many reasons, one of them because it uh, is conducive to the thriving of pathogenic organisms. Another one because it disrupts the proper function of the immune system right so that's not a good thing um, but there are many 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 toxins in that category i won't go through the whole theory of that we talk about that in the detoxification episode which i would strongly recommend that you watch um, but we basically talk about how toxins can often cause the immune system to be dysregulated which then causes inflammation right that's that's the way that it often goes so if you have a load of toxins coming in um, that can cause this situation to get worse as well. Smoking is a big one. I mentioned that earlier. Um, now, smoking is uh, also, of course, a source of loads and loads of different toxins. Smoke, you know, cigarette smoke has got mercury and cadmium and lead and all kinds of stuff. It's got hundreds or thousands of different toxic chemicals. So that's an issue. You're bathing your mouth in toxic chemicals every time you smoke. But the other issue is by breathing in the smoke, you are um, affecting your circulation strongly, negatively. And so uh, that tends to affect the uh, extremities first. And so that is why even from a very, as I said, mainstream medical point of view, smoking is associated with poor oral health and gum disease, um, especially also people with blood sugar issues as well, diabetics, because that's a different reason that you might have circulation issues. And if you combine those two together, that's when gum disease becomes like pretty common because the blood's not getting to the extremities, which includes uh, the gums. Um, and then crowding, I mentioned that for myself earlier again, crowding of the teeth is not as much of an issue if you have that perfect voluminous alkaline mineral bath that I talked about, but as soon as you don't, then you got an issue of, you, th your body's not cleaning it automatically, so automatically so you got to clean it and with a certain degree of crowding you can't clean it that's the position that i was in i had one you know big tooth there in front of two others and it's like how on earth could you get up and in between those you just can't um and before that i kept 
I, honestly, I kept getting cavities. Um, and then I had those te two teeth removed. I didn't want to. Particularly, you know, theoretically, it's not great to remove teeth. But the reality is that um, I didn't have a cavity since then. So it was a good idea to remove those. Um, it would have been better to have done more orthodontic work, I'll be honest. Um, we can talk maybe later about what, you know, why someone would need that in the first place, why it's so common these days that people do have crowded teeth and stuff, uh, if you want to go in that direction. Uh, but the bottom line is once you have them, once you're an adult and you have crowded teeth, that's going to be an issue um, in terms of uh, just pockets where pathogenic organisms can hide and thrive and create acids and dysregulate the immune system and create inflammation. And then another one, and this is often one that people like to focus on in the uh, alternative community, and it's nutritional deficiency. And it is true and it does matter. So I said the alkaline minerals, you know, um, so calcium is the most alkaline of the al alkaline minerals. It's also one of the main things that your teeth is composed of. Uh, but there's a bunch of others as well that probably talk about later when we talk about recommendations. But yeah, when your body doesn't have the basic uh, building blocks, not just to make the teeth, but also to bathe the teeth in this substance, which can help to, yeah, remineralize the enamel. Again, I don't know if you want to talk about that later, but the enamel, that protective layer of the teeth that should stop the cavities being able to form, it is possible to remineralize that. That's becoming pretty much mainstream now. Whether you can get a whole teeth to grow back, I've heard of people claiming that, I, or you know, say if half of it is gone and they can get half it to grow back. I've heard of that. I've not seen it ever personally, and I've also not seen it validated by any kind of scientific, <laughs> like impartial observer. So I don't know. If it's actually possible, my current understanding is that it's not, but it is certainly possible to have like a cavity start on a tooth and by process of cleaning well and remineralizing that tooth, you can kind of get the enamel to come back again. So enamel, the protective layer of a tooth potentially can remineralize and can regrow. But once you get beyond that, my understanding is that, you know, it can't really uh, uh, regrow. So, and then, yeah, just the last one very briefly I'll say is, any disease state or any lack suboptimal health state that leads to a lack of alkaline or volume of saliva, which could be, you know, many different things. Anything that dries up the mucous membranes in general will hurt. Um, and anything that um, uh, uh, uses up excessively the free flow of al alkaline minerals will hurt as you probably know chrissy there's this big movement in the alternative health world i don't know if it's so big anymore but it was of like alkalizing right it's like the thing to do they, they reclaim acidity is the cause of all disease alkaline is the cure of all disease and just alkalize um and one of the tests that you do when you're when you're doing that kind of system is to test your saliva and your urine with these ph test strips and see how alkaline you are now that is nonsense from any mainstream medical point of view and I have to say that from my own point of view, I don't think it's, I think there's a kernel of truth to it, like in terms of their read of the problem, but their method of resolving it is not really helpful in many cases. It can be short term, but generally it's not actually effective long term and can create more problems long term. But one thing that I can say is you can get those little pH test strips and you know, mainstream science would say it's nonsense. You can't tell the acidity of your tissues by measuring your saliva. Fair enough. But can you measure the alkalinity of your saliva by measuring your saliva? Yes, you can. <laughs> so you can at least use it for that and just say, how alkaline is my saliva? And if it is continually, you know, less than pH 7, let's just say, and probably you even want it more, you want it to be 7.58. If it's not that, it means that your teeth are not getting thoroughly bathed with this alkaline enough material. And, and then, yeah, the last thing that's a big one, which is kind of like a, a circular thing, um, is mouth breathing. Um, because when you breathe through your mouth, your mouth dries up. And when your mouth is dry, even if you've got all the alkaline minerals in the world waiting in your uh, uh, saliva ducts, if your mouth is dry, it's not getting to your teeth and gums, right? So um, making sure that your mouth is well lubricated, uh, not just by everything else I said, but also just shutting your mouth. I mean, to me, the only time when you should have your mouth open is if you're talking, 
if you're eating or if you're doing very specific breathing exercises. But this kind of just posture, and I see it all the time on like, movies and stuff, and it bothers me if people are just like slack jawed. And, and most people when they're sleeping, like they sleep with their mouth open and then they wonder why when they wake up in the morning, their breath smells like, you know what? Um, I mean, it's, it's not the only factor. Maybe they forgot to brush their teeth, but that's the thing. <laughs> Even if they brush their teeth, like your, your mouth can be perfectly, beautifully, pristinely minty fresh just before you fall asleep and you wake up in the morning and it smells like death. Why would that be? That's because you've been breathing your mouth open. It's dried up. The bacteria that inevitably are there, they're all, there's always some bacteria in your whole digestive tract um that maybe they're they're already in your mouth maybe they've come up from your from your uh, stomach or whatever whatever is the case they're there they proliferate because there is no um no alkaline saliva or not enough alkaline saliva and there's always some residue of food no matter how much you try and get rid of it all and uh, and then yeah that causes that uh diseased smelling breath so uh Mouth breathing is a big one as well. Yeah, we lovingly refer to it as armadillo breath when you first wake up in the morning. Yeah, not so great. It's like you quick, go brush your teeth. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but granted, I have no idea what an armadillo's breath does smell yeah, like. It's just, you know. <laughs> fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> but one of the things that you have really helped me with, especially is building blocks. And I know you mentioned that a little bit ago, is having those building blocks so that your body can make what it needs. Because I know that that was something that we caught up for me. You know, I really needed some support here so you know that is a big factor because if your body doesn't have those building blocks it can't even begin to start to do what it knows how to do to help you along the way yes and i didn't go into them because i figure we'll do it in the how-to section um but i guess one of them i'll just mention now uh is water you know that's another thing so one of the reasons your mouth might be dry is because your mucous membranes are dried up another reason your mouth might be dry is because you're breathing with your mouth open but another reason could be because you're dehydrated so that's another thing to be on top of. So H2O, uh, if you need it, is very important too. Which brings me to, you know, as well, going towards the mouth and talking about all of that. And you talked about, you know, receding gum lines and things like, can you talk to us a bit? Like, why are the gums so important to us and to our overall health? Yeah, it's a good question. So there's not, there's not really such a thing as a chronic tooth infection that lasts a long time without pain. So there is such a thing as chronic tooth infection. Sometimes people have them and they don't deal with it and they manage to get away with it for ages. So I guess technically you could call it chronic. But you're going to have pain, you're going to have discomfort, you're not going to be able to chew on that side of your mouth or whatever, right? You're going to have to take painkillers. And so that tooth infection, tooth decay, and also it eats away at the tooth. So eventually, even if, you know, it'll, it's very un unusual that it would persist for a long time without being treated. Gum infection, on the other hand, that's chronic um can be relatively unnoticed so it's kind of in the same category as cardiovascular disease where people are like i'm fine i'm fine i'm fine heart attack because they didn't realize that they had a problem and so gum disease is not actually that different you could be like i'm fine i'm fine i'm fine i'm fine oh my god my teeth are starting to fall out like because there's you don't necessarily experience pain and discomfort with gum disease like you do with tooth decay um and so so it has all the problems that I already talked about, right? The, the, the inflammation and the infection and what that does to the immune system and uh, the toxicity that it creates and all the stuff I already talked about. It's just much more likely to happen with the gums than with the, uh, the teeth and, in fact, the rest of the mouth. Um, so, yeah, I mean, the gums are the thing that holds the teeth in place, right? And the other, the other thing is it's so easy for it to happen to a gum. So... Like with your mouth, yeah, you can bite it sometimes or it can get scratched or damaged or something. But the thing about the gums is because they're holding the teeth in place, it's so easy for a piece of bacteria food, also known as food, to get lodged in between the teeth and the gums, either at the front, the back, in between, and for you not to be able to, uh, or not realize and not get to it and th for it to proliferate and become a problem. So I'd say it's because of how easily it could become infected and how long it can be infected without us even noticing, without re even realizing, and the impact that has systemically for the whole body. Um, so, you know, chronic inflammation of the gums, even according to mainstream, it's been, you know, shown it can potentially contribute to 
cardiovascular disease, diabetes, uh, respiratory diseases, um, even uh, adverse pregnancy outcomes, you know, miscarriage and stuff like that. I mean, it, it's serious stuff. And I mean, that's like the, the, the what's the word, the Google list, but I'd, I'd, you know, spread it to, why you more broadly that, than that? I'd spread it to all kinds of area, any kind of infection, sinus infection, ear infection, especially because it's sort of ear, mouth and throat are all, you know, uh, the same kind of area, um, uh, SIBO, SIBO, all of those kind of gastrointestinal issues. Like, like it does, it goes on and on and on and on. And it can all start with this innocent little infection that you don't even realize is there and you don't even feel any discomfort or maybe you only feel it when you floss and therefore you don't floss. Or, But, you know, it's like <laughs> uh, it could be something you can get away with ignoring for decades, but... So I think that's why it's so dangerous because it's so insidious. Well, then that leads me to, you know, going into more of a distinction of, you know, going into, we talked about the gums health, but what is gum disease versus gingivitis? Is it the same or periodontal disease, you know, and then, and how do those two impact us overall? Yeah, it's a good question. So my understanding of the difference, um, and again, I taught this by dentist, is that gum disease between gum disease and gingivitis because they're very similar the thing that they have in common is that they're both chronic infection of the gums and even chronic inflammation of the gums but the one difference is that with the gum disease there is bone loss so meaning so the the, the gums um so we got this this the bone the jaw right and then you got this layer of film over it the gum and then you got the teeth embedded in there so with bone loss what happens is the bones start to recede but the gum is still where it is so you get this larger and larger space between the top of the gum and the bottom of the gum it should be a small space but as the but as the uh tooth sorry as the uh jaw the bone recedes you get a bigger a bigger gap right that gap is more and more likely to have worse and worse infection because again you can't get in there and clean it very easily and sometimes not even at all um, so you have these pockets of infection between the teeth usually especially and so that's you know why gum disease is worse but they're both the same and then of course gum disease will eventually lead to losing your teeth as the bone recedes more and more eventually you have so much bone loss that the teeth start to become loose and then because they're loose, that means that there's space and then an infection can get in there and then, you know, generally it has to be removed. It becomes infected and it, it's beyond repair. So that's why gum disease is worse than gingivitis, uh, really because of the impact it has on your teeth itself. You're actually going to lose your teeth eventually if you have gum disease that you do not get under control, like I was saying earlier, and basically kind of make it go into remission is the best you can manage. What you can manage... Again, this is my understanding. My understanding is pretty mainstream. I'm open to being corrected, but I've not seen anyone um, saying that they can restore that bone loss that is credible to me yet. I'm open to it. If someone does, I'm happy to try it. Uh, but my understanding is once you've had that bone loss, what you can do is you can get your gums to shrink down so that they are just co coating the top of the bone again. There's not this big pocket of them. And so that's really your goal. Um, but you're not really going to get the bone to grow back significantly because we're talking about, you know, quite a lot of uh, space there. Because so so what's the difference? That's the difference in practice. The understanding that the mainstream has, and I don't have a different understanding, is that that's caused by autoimmunity. So they don't classify gum disease as an autoimmune disease, but it kind of basically is because what it is, what they say is, so in both cases, gingivitis and gum disease, you have chronic infection in your gums. But the difference is with gum disease, your immune system starts to react to that and starts to attack and eat away at the bone the, that's holding the uh, teeth in place where, that the gums are covering. So the, the, the immune system is actually attacking uh, uh, the bone and that's why it's receding. So that's my understanding. That's the mainstream understanding. I'm open to being corrected uh, as to exactly what's going on there, but that's as far as I understand it. So, so the challenge of that, assuming that's correct, which I believe it to be, as everyone says, if you have auto, if you have one type of autoimmune disease, you're much more likely to have several types of auto, autoimmune disease. 
And as again, I, they don't technically classify gun diseases as autoimmune disease. I don't know why not, because they do agree of what I just said, that it's the immune system wearing down the bone. So how would that not be autoimmune disease? I don't know, but whatever. So if you have that type of autoimmunity, you're much more likely to have arthritis. You're much more likely to have Sjogren's. You're much more likely to have Hashimoto's, uh, even lupus. You know, you're much more likely to have these other uh, MS, you know, seen more perhaps as an autoimmune disease. So you're much more likely to have these other autoimmune diseases that are more serious and more painful and, you know, possibly even more deadly if you have one. So that's why, that's another reason why gum disease specifically is really not good. And periodontal disease, as far as I understand it, is um, that infection of the tooth. So there's the infection of the tooth, and there's the infection of the gums, and the infection of the gums is split into with autoimmune bone loss or without autoimmune bone loss. So overall, I mean, why would you say people get gum disease? I mean, is it is it hereditary? Is it something that's passed down, inevitable, or is there something else out there? There is a genetic component, as I said. We have a report on it and genetic insights in our oral health collection. Um, I found this to be fairly reliable. As with every genetic report, um, just because it says you don't have a genetic chance doesn't mean it won't happen. Because, of course, if you, despite whatever genes you've got, if you create a bad enough environment, you can still make it happen. <laughs> and also, despite whatever genes you've got, if you create a good environment, you can prevent it from happening. Uh, but it is still pretty um, predictive. So there is absolutely that genetic component. In terms of why people have autoimmunity in general, I think it is one of the main reasons. The other one we talked about in the detoxification episode, it's the um, Im immune system's completely rational response to uh, toxins that it doesn't know what to deal with. And it's the immune system's rational response to chronic infections. Um, but that tendency to have more of the pro-inflammatory um, constituents in the immune system and less of the regulatory constituents of the immune system. I definitely do see that there is a genetic component to that, and we do have reports on that individually as well. You know, your IL-17, your IL-10 and all that, do, do you have this tendency for the pro-inflammatory um, constituents or not? So there is definitely that genetic uh, uh, part of it. But a big part of it as well is um, absolutely environmental, like and specifically the environment that, you uh, create in your mouth but in terms of why someone has gum disease instead of just gingivitis in terms of what you just said I think those are the big factors uh, genetics cro other chronic infections that may predispose to autoimmunity and then toxicity that may predispose to autoimmunity you mentioned earlier about you know what's inside the body, what's outside the body, bacteria and things like that. So, and considering that the gut is technically outside of the body, does it play a role with our oral bone health? Yeah, definitely. I mean, the digestive tract is all the way from mouth to anus, right? It's one tract, it's one system. This should technically be you know, valves and systems to stop cross-contamination between different areas of the digestive tract, but they do not always work properly. That can cause all kinds of issues. And in fact, I didn't mention that yet, but that is one of the other things that can cause um, poor oral health is absolutely acid reflux. So that's when the valve from the stomach up to the esophagus and the mouth um, it malfunctions sometimes, maybe for excessive acidity in the stomach or maybe for whatever reason. I'll talk about that in a different episode. Uh, but bottom line is if you have that acid reflux, you have an extremely strong acid going into your mouth. And same if you vomit, you know. Now, I'm not totally against vomiting. I think it, it's actually... A, Sometimes it's a very powerful, uh, it certainly does uh, trigger the, uh, the um, um, calming part of the nervous system quite powerfully. Um, so, you know, in certain, I don't think you should restrict your urge to vomit is what I'm saying. But if you, if you need to, and also, of course, it can be life-saving because it's trying to get poisons out. Um, so I'm not against it on a, for a psychological basis. I'm not against it on a, 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 on a pathological basis of getting rid of toxicity. But be aware of your vomit. You've probably got very, very strong acid in your mouth, and it's probably you know, quite damaging to the enamel that's protecting your teeth. So definitely always want to thoroughly alkalize your mouth again with, by brushing or whatever um, if you do vomit or if, if you have an acid reflux incident of any kind. So that's one way that it can affect it. Um, 
Another way that it can affect it is, again, as I say, these the valves are not just letting acid come back up, but they can absolutely let, you know, organisms of various kinds come up as well. So um, there is, you know, a situation of maybe even if you hypothetically were to clean all the biofilm out of your mouth and off your teeth and all the rest of it, which is not easy, but you get that kind of thorough deep cleaning situation in your mouth and then and not eat anything and go to sleep you could still wake up with a bunch of bacteria in your mouth it's because it's they've actually come back from uh, uh the intestines and again this is well known like if someone has really bad breath then the first thing you probably look is for some kind of decay in their mouth but if you can't find any then what you normally say is oh well it's caused by the digestive tract it's it's just actually coming up from the digestive system so yeah we talked earlier about how the mouth can poison the digestive tract but it goes both ways. It doesn't go the other way as easily because the valves should stop it going back up again, but in reality, it doesn't in many cases. We're gonna take a quick break to share with you one of our amazing sponsors, Genetic Insights. What makes Genetic Insights uniquely valuable is that they test over 83 million different variants, which guarantees a 99.7% accuracy on all of their DNA reports. With over 100 reports available, you get comprehensive insights into what your DNA is telling you about how to optimize your health today and in the future. I found reviewing my results to be incredibly accurate and applying some of the recommendations which are personalized to your individual DNA to be extremely helpful for me and my family. I also loved how easy it was to upload my raw DNA data that I already had from previously using Ancestry.com because Genetic Insights supports uploading raw data from all major platforms. To get your health reports, go to geneticinsights.co and get 20% off today by using coupon code rejuvenate. Remember that supporting our sponsors supports our podcast, which allows us to keep sharing this important information with you free of cost. So go get your Genetic Insights health reports by going to geneticinsights.co and use coupon code rejuvenate for 20% off today. And then this is a question I'm really hoping for an answer for, so... No pressure. <laughs> Can you okay. fix receding gums? <laughs> um, so that depends on the definition. As I said, I'm open to being educated on this further. Um, if you do, do you mean as a result of gum disease? Because where else will they recede, right? Yeah, uh, yeah, exactly. They're receding. They, you've gone to the dentist. They're like, mm, they're receding. We can patch it for you. We can put something there, blah, blah, blah. But you're like, oh, you know, I don't know what to do or how do I fix this or can I even fix this? Or is it just that's it for the rest of your life? <laughs> so, like I said, um, the gums are not going to recede without bone loss first, right? Uh, because the, the layer of gum over the bone is not that thick. So... Uh, the, the, just the receding of the gum in itself i don't maybe i'm not unaware of it but i don't think that is really an issue that is generally focused on it's more that there's bone loss and therefore the gums are receding meaning that they are going down as well as the bone right which then means that the tooth are going to get more loose was that one of the things that they said yes i don't know if this is for you or someone else yeah okay so yeah so that's the result of gum disease my understanding is you can't get that bone to grow back. So in fact, you want the gum to recede because the gum doesn't recede along with the bone. You're going to have this big pocket of gum where, which is going to be full of infection and inflammation. So you actually, the reason why I said I got, I've been given for years now this clean bill of health despite having gum disease in the past is basically because what's happened is I've taken care of it so well and dealt with it in the way that we'll talk about that now the gum has receded back to the line of where the bone loss was. And so it's just a little bit lower now. It, I think mine was grade one out of four. So I guess it wasn't so bad. So it does depend on how much it is receded. Um, but, but now, so that may seem like a bad thing. Oh, well, when you want your gum to go down, but yes, because if the gum goes down and matches the bone exactly like at the level it should be, if there's no pocket, if there's no pocket, then there should be no more inflammation. And then therefore there should be no autoimmunity and therefore there should be no more your immune system attacking your and causing more bone loss. So 
I don't know. I'm open to hearing about someone who uh, says that they can get that bone to regrow again. But my understanding is, unless your tooth is already falling out, it's you haven't lost too much bone, right? And so all, all you've got to do is completely stop that inflammation, completely stop the infection, which will completely stop the bone loss, and then you'll be in that position, and you can be in that position then for many decades to come. So you can't get the gums to regrow because you don't wouldn't want to without getting to the bone to regrow, and you can't get the bone to regrow, but you can stabilize the whole situation. That's my understanding. And so then to be clear, that would be the same for fixing periodontal disease or gum disease, correct? Uh, yeah, I, my understanding is that they're actually yeah, the same thing. Um, I, I keep using the term gum disease because that's what I've heard from my dentist, but I think they call it periodontal disease in the in the in the states. Yeah, separated by a common language as usual. So <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Um, and then I, it was going to take me to you know the coloring of the teeth. You know, mm. you would see they do whitening things like that, and you know, are white teeth a sign of good oral health? <laughs> so I'd say actually. I'll take a, again, controversial perspective from an alternative world point of view. I would say, yes, they are. Um, so there's a few different things that cause yellowing of the teeth. Uh, one is dyes and one is uh, infection again. So infection is not a good thing. Uh, dyes can be neutral, like they're not necessarily a bad thing. Uh, but if nothing else... Generally, it's never great to have something uh, coating, like coloring your teeth. So overall, I'd say yes, it is a good sign of oral health. However, um, obviously it can be faked, right? And so you could say, uh, I don't know. Uh, big breasts, a sign of like uh, healthy hormones in a woman. Well, yes. But not if they're fake, you know, or are, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I won't use any more sexist examples. But you know, uh, like uh, there are a lot of things. I mean, even with you, know, you could say, uh, you know, um, with men, like being tall is a, a, a sign of uh, you know being a better provider or something. That's why the women often seek taller men. But I've seen they're recently doing surgeries, cosmetic surgeries now, where they're artificially lengthening men's legs to make them taller than they actually, uh, you know, were. And so it is if it's real i think that's the bottom line um if it's as a result of um you know bleaching and stuff like that or the teeth being out you know fake like replaced with uh, uh veneers or whatever it might be then obviously that's not but it is a sign of health um i would say um you know, you, if the if the enamel is especially healthy and robust and thick, then your teeth are going to be whiter. But there is a limit to that, right? Um, and this is why extremely white teeth, often people who choose fake teeth don't choose the extremely white ones because they look fake, right? So it, it is on a scale, but certainly once your teeth have a bit of yellowing to them, like mine, I would say um, are too yellow. Like that is a sign of less than optimal uh, uh, situation. And of course, I've explained why mine are less than optimal right like the all the history i've had and and all the rest of it um and i choose not to bleach and pretend that they're actually whiter than they are um and still you know I, i've spoken in previous episodes of uh you know still dealing with several different types of toxicities quite high levels if and when i manage to address all of those i would expect that my saliva would be more voluminous with more alkaline minerals and then maybe i could get to having uh naturally significantly whiter teeth i don't know we'll wait and see if it happens uh but yeah in terms of me in terms of other people um it is it is a sign of health i would say but you know if you fake it it's just a sign that you faked it <laughs> well, well then that would also you know say is whitening your teeth a good or a bad thing then which <laughs> yeah, i think that's... i know your answer <laughs> <laughs> well what would you guess it's going to be is it probably <laughs> well on the level of its trickery <laughs> uh i'm not yeah i'm not a huge fan of any kind of trickery uh and, uh, because i'm a bit of a fanatic when it comes to the truth but um i'd say it's it's damaging the enamel a little bit a bleach so on that side it's bad however it is killing all the organisms there every time that you bleach so you know some people regularly use like a hydrogen peroxide kind of uh, toothpaste or something like that which is a bleach 
again, in an ideal world with ideal oral health, would you be putting bleach in your mouth every day of any quantity? Probably not, right? But a lot of when we come to oral health, because we don't have the optimal level of nutrients and because we don't have the voluminous bathing of adequate alkalinity, everything is a compromise when it comes to oral health, you know? So... Um, I don't think that there is any research that it like badly bandages the uh, damages the teeth. So I don't do it kind of just on principle that I I don't want to like waste time on something that's appearance based based. But I'm not totally I'm not really against it either. If people want to do it, I have not seen any evidence that it's like really harmful and causes the teeth to age significantly more quickly than anything like that so if you want to go for it then uh, go for it i'd say yeah it has some upside as well what about fluoride i mean you just mentioned you know ba- bathing our teeth or you know our bodies in, in certain things so you know what would your advice be on fluoride good question so yeah let's talk about uh you know remineralizing teeth or supporting the mineralization of teeth so if you ask a dentist why they support fluoride their answer will be that it helps to harden and strengthen the teeth. So the interesting thing about that to me, first of all, is that it implies that putting a mineral in your mouth can remineralize and strengthen your teeth. So that's an idea that's sometimes not fully embraced by some people as like, oh, is that a real thing? But yes, it is. Otherwise, they wouldn't recognize, uh, well, they wouldn't recommend fluoride, right? So by by definition. So So that tells us something interesting. So the only question to me is, Okay, so if you can remineralize your teeth, or at least the enamel, like I said earlier, which is the protective layer, so in a way the most important, um, by putting minerals in your mouth, is fluoride the best candidate? And so if your sole concern in life is hardening your teeth and strengthening your teeth, the answer is maybe, right? It seems to actually be pretty good at that. The only challenge is what it does to the rest of your body. Um, (laughs) uh, So your mouth is not that far away from your brain. uh, And there is a lot... Now, this is not mainstream, but it's getting to be mainstream. And I think it will eventually be mainstream. I don't think this will stay hidden forever. The massively negative effect that um, fluoride has on cognitive function. So um, there's been research about it lowering IQ significantly and IQ is uh, literally the biggest predictor of success in life going across all kinds of spectrum it's even one of the biggest predictors for longevity if you live a long time is how high your IQ is let alone how successful you are in in you know financially and, and in all kinds of areas so IQ is a hugely big deal so to take something that even might reduce your IQ significantly Seems to me to be a hell of a roll to dive just for, you know, possibly hardening the teeth. The other thing that's very, very important, other than your brain, um, that we talked about a lot before is the thyroid gland. And so the thyroid gland tends to be this magnet for a certain group of uh, metals called the halogens, which is uh, iodine, uh, bromine, chlorine, uh, and fluoride. And so... All of those other than iodine are pretty poisonous um, and fluoride being one of them. And all of them as well will displace the iodine in your thyroid gland to some degree um, and cause the thyroid gland to not function as well. I won't talk again about how important it is that your thyroid gland functions as well because I seem to keep talking about it. Uh, but check out our episode on the thyroid and also check out our episode on metabolism. For, to hear me explain just how important um, the thyroid functioning optimally is. So let's just you know, forget all the other accusations that are flo- thrown at fluoride. If even one of those two is fru- uh, true, if, if it just slows down your metabolism or it slows down cognitive function, to me that would seem not worth it, especially when there's an alternative. And there is these days. There's these wonderful toothpastes, which I don't actually use to clean my mouth, but I use to remineralize. Um, and they contain usually something called calcium hydroxyapatite. Uh, if that name sounds familiar to you, it's because it is the stuff that your actual teeth are made out of. <laughs> um, and so you can get that stuff in toothpaste, and it's toothpaste that you should leave on after you brush for like five or ten minutes. You shouldn't rinse straight away. 
you should let it be absorbed. This is one of the things that one of my dentists said about, uh, and he was a mainstream dentist. He said, um, after you brush your teeth, you should leave it for five to 10 minutes. And he meant the fluoride one. He goes, I recommend everyone brush your fluoride toothpaste, but he said, if you rinse it off straight away, it's kind of, it's you know almost pointless. Like you haven't given it a chance to penetrate into your teeth and do what it's meant to do. And so it's the same with this stuff. Uh, there's also, I've seen a zinc version where it's like a zinc that comes in and helps to uh, re-enamel and strength, remineralize and strengthen your enamel on your teeth. So that I've seen, but the calcium one I've seen more often. I mean, it depends. There's one called Bio Repair Plus that is in Europe that is not that expensive. Uh, some of them can be very expensive, but it's unnecessary. I think for $5, you can get like a normal tube of size tube of toothpaste that will, will do this remineralizing job. Um, obviously, I would not recommend that it also has fluoride in because, you know, what's the point if you've got the calcium version? Um, so, yeah, that would be more the direction that I would go in to strengthen and remineralize the teeth. Um, as good as fluoride may be for strengthening the teeth, is it really going to be any better than the stuff that the tooth is already made out of? Probably not. So why not just give it that? Oh, and by the way, calcium is the most alkaline mineral. So when you brush your teeth with that, not only will it remineralize the teeth, will also neutralize a lot of the acidity and, and keep it healthy that way. So yeah, I would not bother with fluoride. I was going to ask, and not to detract, but is fluoride, is that a fat soluble or is it water soluble? Or like, let's say we've been brushing our teeth for a super long time. Our dentist has used fluoride in the past. You know, we were maybe issue, we have a thought that we may have an issue with it. Like, is it easy to get out of the body? Not easy to get out? That's a good question. I'd have to look that up. But my understanding with fluoride in terms of the fact that the, the way that the body holds on to it is that... The, it's magnetically attracted to the thyroid. So the issue is that it's being held onto by the thyroid in preference to iodine, which is actually the thing that needs more. This mechanism of the thyroid is quite well understood. It happens with other things as well. This is why, I don't know if you have come across, but in the case of nuclear fallout, they're always saying you want to top up with iodine. And that's because that, that those radioactive elements will go in there and displace the iodine in the thyroid gland and cause severe issues as a result so by having lots of iodine it's kind of like it competes with those elements to stop too much of the radioactive stuff getting into the thyroid um, so the fluoride gets into the thyroid um, i don't think it is fat soluble i don't think that's the issue of it it's more like an uh, electrical charge thing that it is being held onto by the thyroid and this is a bit of a controversial area we haven't really talked about this yet but there's some evidence that even iodine excess is not great, including for the thyroid. This is not, this is contested. Some people say that large amounts of iodine is a good idea. There's basically cases of people having large amount of iodine and feeling great, but there's also cases of people having large amounts of iodine and it making them really sick. Um, and so I don't, I haven't come to a complete conclusion on that, which is maybe why we haven't done it. But anyway, getting that fluoride is not particularly easy for that reason because of its tendency to magnetically attract to the fire and then the lack of like easy ways of getting it back out again um and, and ditto for the brain so the uh the, there's you know various things that claim to be able to help with uh these kind of things but i haven't dug into it enough to know for sure if any of them work i'm afraid um yeah i'm not quick to answer that one yet i'll look into it good i'm glad I, i've given you something to look into <laughs> yeah you have <laughs> gold star <laughs> um, which then i've got a question too is because it's something that i've you know struggled with or that i deal with is uh, clenching my teeth at night and i know that there are a lot of people out there that grind or they clench at night and of course I wear this most exquisite, fabulous looking night guard when I go to sleep to, to help me. And um, also one of the reasons why I had my mercury fillings, I just had a couple um, changed over to uh, the ceramic or whatever the dentist had, had told me to because I could see the, um, the mercury on the... Um, on my night guard. So I was like, okay, that, I don't think that's good. So I did have that changed over a while. So, so can you talk to us a bit about clenching and grinding and what that does, the impact or potentially even how we can change that? Yeah, hundred percent. So the more misaligned your jaw and teeth are, the more of a problem that is. My teeth and jaw are pretty misaligned. Um, and so 
that means that it will like really wear away on certain areas and there's less resistance right like if it if the weight were completely evenly distributed then the damage would be less but if it's just in certain areas then the damage is more significant this is one of those things again where if all other situ if, if if your oral health situation was perfect it's not such a big deal but if you're in a situation where you've already had some bone loss, if you're in a situation where your, t your enamel's already worn away a bit, if you're in a situation where you already have some chronic inflammation, then grinding will, you know, make, make it worse. It will, you'll wear down the tooth and you wear down the enamel, which is that protective coating. So that can be a dangerous thing. You can outright crack or fracture your teeth, which, you know, can be very problematic because they are not able to heal. Uh, when they're fractured i only found this out recently but um for whatever reason but yeah like teeth don't heal when they're when they're cracked or fractured like bones do uh because even though they have a nerve supply and they kind of have a blood supply they don't have the type of blood supply that will actually allow something to regenerate and grow teeth are an interesting one it's like they're somewhere between bones and hair is how mm. i kind of look at them now so bones is like something totally internal that can regrow and regenerate and then hair is something totally external that can't regrow and regenerate and it's fine to just remove it and teeth are like in the middle of that <laughs> um like they, they do have a nerve supply but they don't have uh, a blood supply so um yeah yeah it's kind of an interesting thing anyway back to the question um, so yeah, there's all the, the manual breaking. There's the fact that then that leaves you open to, you know, it, it, the, the protective layer is worn away. Certainly, as you said, if you've got anything mercury in there, if you've got ceramic in there, whatever, you're, you're wearing away of that. Uh, you can have pieces of that in your mouth that you're then ingesting. There's nothing good about that. Um, what do you do about it? I'll cover this now because it's kind of separate from uh, the, the rest of it. The I had a tendency for this and I even had a dentist try and get me to wear a night guard and I tried it for like an hour and I'm like, screw this, I'm not doing this. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not having this thing in my mouth. There's got to be a better way of dealing with it. Um, and sure enough, there was. So grinding is just a sign of uh, chronic tension and it's a specific type of chronic tension. And this is kind of a big conversation. We talked about this a little bit in the chronic pain episode. Um, we could say it is a neuro, it's a neurochemical pathway that creates a habit. So we kind of, we clenching is usually associated with a few different things. It can be anger, especially held in anger, like, um, you know, like, you'll see an animal like a, when it's gr growling right if it's snarling it's it's clenching its jaw while it's doing it it's also often associated with uh a uh, control so when you hold when you want to control yourself or you want to hold back or so it's not necessarily hostile in any way it can just be a uh, i want to you know i'm not happy with this moment as it is and i want to make it different that's often where uh, jaw clenching comes in as well. So the best approach to this to me is hands down bioenergetics, which is something that I've talked about before. There are other things that work on the same principle, which are also good. I've talked about them before, I think. Um, uh, counter strain is one of them. Um, and what's the other one? Hanasomatics is another one. So they're kind of on the spectrum. Bioenergetics is something you can do totally yourself for free. Uh, but you've got to do it yourself. It's effort. Uh, counter strain is the opposite in the scale. You don't have to do anything yourself, but it tends to cost a lot of money and you've got to go and see someone else do it. And the anisomatics is kind of in the middle. You can get someone to help you or you can do it on your own. Um, and it's more gentle. What they all have in common, even though if you were to talk to any practitioners, they'd say, no, it's unique because of the blah, blah, blah. But what they all have in common is showing your brain what it's doing and retraining it to do something else. And so in the case of, so usually like the natural inclination, if you realize you're tensing something. So, you know, the example I use all the time, because it's easy to illustrate, is like where people have their shoulders up like that, right? So that's a kind of defensive posture. So when you realize you're doing that, oh, oh, I'm doing that, your natural response is like, just, just drop them, right? But then here's the thing. Next time you start to feel defensive, they'll go up again, you won't realize, oh, drop them again. And you can do it like a thousand times, and it's not very effective. 
you'll still just keep doing it because it's like, oh, I do it automatically and then I correct. I do it automatically and then I correct. The better approach, and this is what all these free mentalities have in common, is actually go like this, to write, really, really do it. And to show your body that's what it's doing. In counterweight, someone's kind of puts you in a position, does it for you. In hanasomatics, you kind of do it gently. In bioenergetics, you kind of do it intensely. But in every case, you're kind of showing your body, look, here's how you're tensing yourself. And then you're showing it, and then you're, you're bringing so much awareness there that the brain becomes aware of that area and goes, oh, and then showing it how to relax sometimes, or sometimes just allowing it to relax afterwards and letting the brain go, oh, wait a minute, oh, yeah. Because they're, they're kind of like brain, dead spots neurologically. Your, your brain just doesn't realize you're doing it, right? And so it's exactly the same with that tendency to grind uh, the jaw, TMJ and all of that stuff that they call it. Uh, using a night guard, again, we live in an imperfect world. Sometimes we have to do, you know, we have to compromise. But the ideal solution, but it is kind of, um, it's a band-aid, it's a crutch, you know, like it's not resolving the actual issue. And and I've spoken to um, a few people who specialize in this kind of stuff. And, you know, especially uh, cranial sacral therapists, I've had three of them who I've spoken to who've all said these uh, things are really terrible because it, it uh, the... Um, what they called the 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 muzzles <laughs> what do you call them <laughs> i don't know what you mean you mean the mouth guards what mouth guard yes yeah <laughs> is that what I thought? okay <laughs> it's, a, it's a muzzle right? muzzle <laughs> hello <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the you know the thing that stops you uh chewing on yeah. yourself right yeah, the muzzle yeah, yeah. stops you chewing on someone else but you know it's a similar uh, principle um is that they all you know that they, they um <sighs> Uh, I can't explain it properly, but basically it leads to more of a misalignment of the jaw, according to them, right? Um, so so uh, I would say an ideal, maybe you need a night guard, night guard, jaw, mouth guard, temporarily, but I would prioritize learning to relax those jaw muscles. Um, you know, number one priority. And so bioenergetics and also uh, Reikian work. I would like to actually do an interview soon on this channel with... Uh, one of the people who I learned it from, and and maybe I'll I'll address that one specifically with them. Uh, but yeah, that's 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 really where it's at, and this has so many other benefits to to do this kind of work. I, I do like to uh, uh, do it, and I do like to recommend it, and it's but especially for stuff like that because there's almost nothing else that works for that as evidenced by the solution that you were given, right? Like there's lots of different things to maybe reduce the tendency to be tense in your abdomen or your diaphragm or your chest, but there's not many modalities out there that help you to uh, remove the tension from your jaw. But the three that I just mentioned are all uh, very good, very effective at that. Now you talked uh, previously uh, when we first began really about, you know, sleeping with your mouth open or mouth breathing and how that dries out the mouth and that that's not a good thing because we're wanting to bathe our, our, our mouth and our teeth in the saliva. So the sleep apnea, now that is a big, big thing that is pretty widespread to, you know, to this day and age, snoring, things like that. So bar the um, dehydration and the mouth being dry, uh, you know, which we know that that's, that's going to have a negative impact. Are there any other things or that you can touch on it to help anyone that may be struggling with that sleep apnea and how it's impacting them? I think I'd rather address sleep apnea in the sleep episode because okay. I have quite a lot to say about that one and I don't want to derail it too much from, but I, I, I mean, I can see why you say it here because it's, um, uh, you know, what they say is that it's swallowing the tongue, right, which then restricts the airway, um, which then means that people are uh, waking up. Um, but, yeah, I, yeah, I think it's more of a sleep issue. I'd rather put it with sleep. What I will say about the open mouth at night, though, is if that is a tendency for you, you can get these uh, little strips that you put on your mouth. Um, they're like clear little sticky things. Some people just use a big piece of tape as well. Uh, just taping up the mouth it sounds kind of crazy um it, i got it from buteco methods those guys are really big on this um i ha have not done it for years but then again i haven't mouth breathed at night for years so um it, i think it for me at least it was very effective to 
learn to not mouth breathe and then I just didn't do it anymore and so I didn't need them anymore it wasn't something that I continually needed uh, but I did it for whatever it was a few months and it was great um, it's just to relearn how to breathe through your nose now to some people that's not too easy and so we probably need to do a whole episode on that like sinuses and, and breathing and respiration and stuff like that but um, if you can breathe through your nose you just have more the habit of breathing through your mouth then they can be really helpful yeah, and I love that there are tools to help help us get to the other side. It's not necessarily something that's going to be, you know, a lifelong thing. <clears throat> Excuse me, a lifelong thing, but mm-hmm. it can definitely help put you into the habit of it, the practice of it. Because as well, like since we've been talking and you, we discussed breathing and and things like that, I've noticed myself a little bit more. Like, oh wait a minute, I'm not breathing through my nose, and consciously bringing myself back to it. So. Yeah, it's a, it's a bit of a process, but I did get some of the tape too, just to practice, you know, see how I go with it and just, yeah, help my body get back into the habit of breathing through the nose. So I think that's a really, really big, important point that not many of us know about really. Yeah, the person who I'd really credit with like doing the science on that, as well as explaining it really well, is a guy called James Nestor. He did a book called Breathe and the first, you know, good, 100 pages or so he really talks about that and so Buteco method always has it had it as a thing for almost a century but he went in and really got the evidence for it and he was even brave enough with him and a a colleague to do a test where they did I think it was 10 days of 100% nose breathing and 10 days of 100% mouth breathing um and uh the difference it made to his health was astronomical right like his blood pressure went through the roof and cholesterol and like all of these markers for poor health just exploded when he did mouth breathing all the time and and got better as soon as he went to nose breathing i mean it, it made a massive difference so uh i'm a huge fan of that i cannot explain it as well as he does Again, I'd love to interview him one day. He, he did a brilliant job explaining that. That was already my anecdotal experience for several years that I, I 100% believed it was a good thing, but I could not explain it as well as he did. He, he really went into researching it and even doing experiments on it very thoroughly. It's a great resource. Thanks. Yeah, I'll put the link definitely in the description for below for anybody that wants to look him up. Now, the question I am going to ask you now is, you know, is it possible for somebody to keep all of their teeth from birth till death? I mean, you do see like in the old ancient times back, you know, where there's skulls and and there's these beautiful full sets of teeth. They're all perfectly formed. But today it's like, that just doesn't seem to be the case. So, I mean, is there any hope for us? Well, can someone keep all their teeth until they die? Yeah, they can die young. Um, (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> right. I mean, we haven't really got into that. And it's and again, James Nestor, funnily enough, talks about this a lot, although I wouldn't say maybe he's not the world expert on this one, although he explains it very well. And that's like why so many, so many of us have misaligned teeth, right? Why we have crowded teeth um, and all the rest of it. Because this is a factor, right? All other things being equal, I know I said a bunch of different factors, but one of them, if your teeth are very crowded, it is very hard to keep them all healthy throughout your entire life. And so that's a factor. And so if we ask, again, mainstream dentists and doctors why teeth are crowded, they usually say genetics. Um, I had a dentist tell me, uh, not not actually a person who was my dentist, but in a business conference, he said it's, oh, because there was a mismatch between your mother's, you know, blueprint and your father's one, right? And it just ended up with you having these you know, double vampire teeth. Um, I don't think we don't have a genetic report yet on teeth crowding or misaligned teeth. Maybe it will come eventually, but I don't think there is any significant science on that yet. Otherwise we would have that report available. Um, So my understanding is that it's more environmental, not genetic. And there's a guy called Weston Price, who was a dentist who traveled the world and visited all kinds of indigenous tribes who had had very little contact at the time with any um, any kind of Western world people and looked at their jaws, photographed them. And there was a striking difference. In some cases, he even managed to find twins where one twin was raised in this indigenous environment with a traditional diet going back millennia. And then another one had eaten like modern Western diet. And the difference, and this is from very young, if not birth, and the difference in their mouth was shocking, you know? So the one who'd eaten the uh, traditional diet was like 
you know, perfect draw, perfect amount of spacing, no restriction of the airways, all the rest of it. The one who'd eaten the modern Western diet was, you know, crowded teeth, slim jaw, restricted airways. It was just like a huge, huge difference. He came to the conclusion because of that, that it was all about the nutrients which were in the traditional diet and not in the modern Western diet. I guess we'll talk about those very soon, the nutrients. Um, I'm not convinced that's the only factor. I've already talked about many of the other factors that I think are involved. Um, but my understanding is that basically it's down to breathing. It's that issue of breathing again. When it comes to breathe, breathing, uh, it's very important. So to go back to your original question, I really think whether you can keep all your teeth until you die, it really depends on when you start. If you start trying to be healthy when I did, which is when you already have gum disease and cavities and all the rest of it, and you were born with crowded teeth, uh, uh, either genetically or probably more likely environmentally, uh, as we've just started talking about. Um, it's, it's an uphill struggle. It's not impossible, but it's really very difficult. If you do it, say at the age of 20, when you haven't got any decay or gum disease yet, but your mouth is already fully formed and you already have crowded teeth, it's still somewhat difficult. But if you start when you're really young, like when you're five and you have the appropriate diet um, and your jaw forms correctly and your teeth are not crowded and you generally are healthy and therefore you are bathing your mouth in plenty of alkaline mineral saliva solution on an ongoing basis, then you almost certainly can. So I think that those are like, those are the three phases that you're in. Like you're either, you, your teeth haven't become crowded yet or they are crowded, but they haven't become decayed and, and inflamed yet or they have become decayed and inflamed. If you're in that third category, they have already become decayed and inflamed and all the rest of it. I don't know if you still can, but it's, it's not going to be easy if it's even possible. Uh, and most mainstream dentists would say it's not possible, right? Again, unless you die young enough. <laughs> But I assume that's not what you meant by the question. No. Um, <laughs> um, so, yeah, I would look more at um, preventing. You know, when, once you're our age, it's, it's, pretty, uh, it's pretty difficult, I would say, to be honest. And again, now, that's with current technology. They are working on, like, stem cell regrowing tooth stuff. And so if you hold on, maybe another 10 years, maybe another 20 years or whatever, they may well just be able to regrow our teeth in a lab and then put them on. And, and they're, you know, genetically, they're, a, they're identical to ours. And so there's no, you know, autoimmune issue and whatnot. So um, that's possible. We may be able to, you know, 3D print genetically identical teeth at some point, <laughs> you and I, but uh, we're probably not going to keep all of our God-given ones if we're already in that place where we have loads of cavities and, fairly uh, advanced gum disease yeah not exactly what i wanted to hear but i get it you know yeah just <laughs> i hear my parents talking about oh the root canal or all oh, the crown or all oh, this and i'm just like oh no thank you but yeah well yeah as i said look the the changes that the possibilities that may be coming with uh, uh technology are significant and amazing and i have seen this right um the, the regrowing of various different things is not that far away, even, you know, fingers and, and maybe limbs and all the rest of it. So a tooth is actually not such a big deal. Um, I think it will be possible, but it's just not going to be your original one. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, then speaking of the originals and what we currently do have, you know, what is the secret to, you know, having healthy teeth and gums? You know, what... Are, you know, give us the recommendations, Ellen. Tell us how you are able to, you know, reverse or, you know, really make changes and shifts in, in your own health. Yes, I will. And I'll just go back to what you're saying. I know one of the things you've done is Invisalign recently. Is that right? Or you I did that it? a while ago. Yeah. So, well, my journey was, you know, when I was younger, uh, you know, teeth removed. So because it, it had the, the works, you know, the headgear, the braces, you know, all that great stuff when you're just running through high school because it's so great um, and the pain that goes with it and all that. But then um, the teeth kind of, you know, my lower teeth it started to go back. So then I think it was probably about 
10 years or so ago, I did some an Invisalign okay. just to help yeah, realign the teeth and um, just make sure, you know, have, help them go back. So yeah, I've, I've done both. So I will say, because you've done that and I haven't, your chances are significantly better than mine because that alignment of the teeth, like one of the reasons that they often won't last until you die is because once you've had the, the bone receding and then the teeth are looser, like the thing that will actually ultimately mean that they get infected underneath or come out is because of the misalignment of the jaw and the teeth. And then there's the uh, uneven impact against them that is loosening them. So if you have a perfect bite, as they say, and, and like a, a really nice alignment in the jaw, then your chances are seeming better. So long as you do all the other stuff we're about to talk about. <laughs> well, perfect. Yeah. So now uh, <laughs> that list of recommendations, you know, what can we do to have healthy teeth and gums? Okay. So in general, I'll do first and then I'll do teeth and gums one at a time. Okay. So in general, um, cleanliness, right? Electric toothbrush is better than a normal toothbrush. Soft head is fine. Not like really pushing and digging is great. No one's telling you to really go for it. Like in terms of really digging. In fact, what I've been taught about this is that the toothbrush, the main thing that you want to do with electric toothbrush is go in between the teeth and the gums. So it's way less important that you're rubbing the toothbrush all over your teeth. It's much more important that you're getting that line between the two because that, the vast majority of the time, is where the foods, the pieces, the fragments of food are going to get stuck and then the infection is going to start to proliferate. So toothbrush is merely, like it's a cursory movement over your teeth, but it's really for that line between the tooth and gums. I personally recommend doing it after every meal, any or at least anything that's acidic, uh, or anything that's sugary. So even if I were to drink a water with lemon juice, not that I do, but even that, I would brush my teeth after that or do the other stuff that I'm talking about. It, unless, of course, you have ample, voluminous alkaline saliva, in which case it's fine. It doesn't matter. But if you don't, then you need to have a, a supplement that. You need a facsimile of that. You need something to go in there and alkalize it manually because your body is not up to doing it itself. So... Doing some kind of alkaline mineral cleansing after consuming sugar and or acids is really important. Um, cleaning in between the teeth is absolutely crucial. Uh, interdental brushes are really where it's at. Floss is so 20th century, right? 21st century, um, there's all, there's, and you've got to get different sizes, right? This is what I was taught that got me from chronic keep having cavities and keep having worse and worse gum disease to no more cavities, gum disease and remission is this. So everything that I'm saying to you now. So interdental brushes, it depends on like some, maybe if your teeth are just uniformly crowded, maybe you just need like a small brush for every one. For me, it's like between some of the teeth, there's like a big gap and some of the teeth there's a small gap. So I have to have all these different sizes and I need to go in there with the right size one. And this has got to be at least once a day. This is not something that anyone wants to hear. It's a goddamn hassle. It's painful. It's unpleasant. But you have to do it, and you have to do it at least once a day, and you have to get in there and make sure it doesn't... It's uh, Keep doing it, and then you won't... You haven't really got anywhere until there's no bleeding, even when you do it vigorously. Well, the other interesting things that I heard from the hygienist, which really helped me turn things around, was your gum should be as tough as the soles of your feet. Mm. meaning if you get a little metal pointy thing and you accidentally stab them, they shouldn't bleed in the same way as you get a little metal pointy, you know what I mean? The interdental brushes, right? If you were to poke the interdental brush on the sole of your foot, it's not going to bleed. And similarly, if you accidentally poke the interdental brush into your gum, it shouldn't bleed. And so if it does, that's a sign of inflammation. And that means there's some infection there. Now, I remember, and this is something I was taught even longer ago, before I really resolved the situation, I remember I had some pain in somewhere, and they said, and they said, we don't have any appointments available, but you know what you need to do? Just dig in there. So uh, there's the kind of not toothbrushes, but the, the little toothbrushes, the little tooth with a little brush with a pointy head, I don't know what they're called. A dental brush, I think maybe they're called over here, but probably different in America again. But these little pointy toothbrushes, and... And you basically just get in there and you dig in there, especially if it's sore or if it's bleeding or whatever, and you make it bleed as much as possible. Sounds crazy. Why on earth would you do that? Because 
what they say is it's disturbing the area of infection. It, 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 and then the blood, even though it's not nice, it's, it's flushing the infection out. And then you brush and you do your alkaline minerals and whatnot. Um, and then you keep doing that until it stops bleeding. And you do that for everywhere that you have that issue. And so, as I said, you kind of actually want the gums to recede back to the line of the bone, of the jaw. You do not want any pockets. It's the pockets of the gums that cause the really serious issues. So you get into those pockets with the interdental brushes and you break it up and it will bleed and you keep doing it. And then if you do it for a while and you do the other stuff I'm talking about, it will stop bleeding and it will not be difficult. It will not be painful. It will be nothing. You'll just get in there, you'll dig in there, and it'll be about as painful, difficult as, you know, doing it on the sole of your foot. And you can see as well, like, your gums will go from being red if they're inflamed to being like a, a light pinky kind of color, which is what they're supposed to be. Um, so that's in terms of hygiene. The other thing I already talked about, which is the remineralizing, right? So also, I personally don't use that really mineralizing toothpaste to clean my teeth. Uh, to clean my, all right, so let's talk about cleaning. I don't like the fluoride toothpaste, but I actually don't like most of the alternative ones either. The fluoride ones, they tend to leave your teeth feeling quite clean, but then the, you've also poisoned yourself a bit with fluoride. Um, most of the alternative ones, like they don't really leave your teeth feeling clean. I really like this brand called Uncle Harry's. It's basically a combination of calcium carbonate, which is a super alkaline mineral, um, uh, bentonite clay, which is an absorber of toxicity. We talked about that in the detox episode. Colloidal silver. Silver is a killer of most organisms. Um, and then it's a bunch of different uh, essential oils, all of which have a strong antiseptic killing of pathogen kind of action to various degrees. Things like cinnamon, mustard, mint. Uh, I can't remember all the clove oil, you know, all of, all of those oils that are good at killing them. And that's it. And that's... I like it. It's, it feels like a real toothpaste. It leaves your mouth feeling really clean. And again, as I say, even though I haven't got great oral health, every dental professional is surprised at how good it is considering the gum disease I used to have. So it's probably as good as it's going to get. Um, so, there's, so, and I never tell them I use this toothpaste, not fluoride one, because <laughs> you know what doctors are like. Like you literally, you know, they heal all the time, right? I followed this diet and I lost 50 pounds. I go to the doctor and he goes, you can't follow that diet. It's extreme. And then... And then you go back to your old diet and you gain the weight again. So I don't want to do the dental equivalent of that. But uh, so, yeah, I that's why. I, so I use that to clean the Uncle Harry's one. There's different flavors. I like the cinnamon one. I think they also have aniseed and several types of mint. Most people just like mint because that's what they're used to. Um, and then I use like a remineralizing one in addition to that. I might do that, as I say, if I just have a drink and they don't really need brushing. There's no food to remove. Um, or I might just do it afterwards or last thing at night or something like that, but get some kind of remineralizing toothpaste in there as well. And that's dental hygiene in a nutshell. Uh, some people like the water pick to get in there. I think that's good in addition, but I think that's more for people who have dentures and like a situation where you can't get into there with the interdental brushes because it's not as powerful as the interdental mm -hmm. brushes. If people like it, then great. But I would say it's like... It's just not as effective as the incidental brushes. And so the only reason you would use it is because maybe you've just had implants or you've got dentures or something where an incidental br brush would just be too harsh. Um, but as I said, generally harsh is good in terms of really getting in there and, and digging into wherever there is that inflammation and bleeding to get whatever is stuck in there out. So that's the point. Sorry, maybe I didn't explain that. Why would you want to get into there when it's bleeding? Because it's probably bleeding because there's an infection it's probably infection because some food debris is stuck in there so you want to really r dig in there to really clear it out make sure that there's nothing stuck in there anymore and also disturb the whole area of infection um so that's that's hygiene uh if we go back to my original list so biofilm um a lot of the essential oils I just mentioned that's in uncle harry's will also disrupt that pathogenic biofilm so there's certain foods that will do that as well. Uh, quince is a, one example of fruit. If you eat quince, you have this dry taste in your mouth. It's because it's really like breaking down the whole biofilm. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's uh, not easily available. Toothpaste with those essential oils will do that. Um, I talked about, you know, alkaline mineral substitutes, but the whole issue of 
why do you not have enough alkaline minerals in your teeth is a big one that I probably won't get into uh, in this episode because it's such a big one. But I would say refer back to um, our episode on detoxification specifically. Um, and uh, But there is another aspect of it. So you either don't have enough alkaline minerals in there because the alkaline minerals are busy or you don't have enough alkaline minerals in there because you don't have enough alkaline minerals in your body in general, right? And so in terms of the latter, that's easily resolved by consuming more alkaline minerals. So for tooth health, I would go, so it's not just about bathing your teeth in calcium toothpaste, it's also about actually eating calcium, right? Now, there's this some, you know, controversial, the highest calcium food by far is dairy, right? Some dairy, like milk, for instance, has a lot of sugar. Sugar can cause, you know, bacteria to grow. So there's a whole thing about, yeah, dairy isn't necessarily good for your teeth. Other people say, you know, if you have a lot of milk, for instance, it's, it's a lot of sugar, and then your body actually robs calcium from your bones to neutralize it, and so it isn't good for your bones at all. I'm not 100% sure about that, but at least in terms of your teeth, it's it's a bit like good and bad, right? You've got the good calcium, but you've got the bad sugar. Um, when it comes to, you know, cheese, that's more of a tooth healthy food, I would say, because it tends to be very low in sugar. And also because it's, cheese tends to be one of the highest sources of a nutrient that, in terms of what most people eat anyway, of a nutrient called vitamin K2. Mm. And vitamin K2 is one of the most important nutrients when it comes to the health of teeth and bones. Um, in fact, Weston Price, who I mentioned earlier, the dentist who traveled the world, he, as I said, decided that um, it was nutritional differences that made a difference. Oh, I didn't, I didn't quite address that, why I didn't 100% agree with that. Because the understanding that's come about these days is that Yes, it is the Western diet that causes that crowded tea situation, which is why orthodontists are so much more necessary for us in the so-called developed world versus indigenous people. But it's not necessarily only lack of nutrients like Western Prize thought. It's, in fact, from a, what's understood these days, it's mainly the amount of allergic reactions we have to the food that we eat causing our sinuses to be more blocked, causing us to breathe through more through our mouth, causing our jaw to grow in the wrong way. So mouth breathing is not only a bad idea once you're in this mess, it may actually also be the cause of the mess in the first place. So the idea being the people eating the indigenous diets, yes, they got the nutrients that they needed, like the vitamin K2, which we'll talk about in a sec, but it's actually probably more that they didn't have the allergens in their diet, and so they carried on nose breathing, and so they carried on having a mouth bathed in alkaline minerals in terms of tooth decay, but also there's something about uh, breathing that way that means that you hold your palate in a certain way that basically means that the jaw grows differently. Mm. I don't understand it in enough detail to really explain it well. Again, James Nestor does explain it in his book, Breathe, and there are actually many other people who've got into that. As I said, this is not really alternative. This is the this is the mainstream understanding, or one of the mainstream understandings these days about what causes the misalignment of the teeth and the jaw. So if you if you go I guess if you Google or if you look up, you're gonna quite easily find, you know, more information on how that works. But basically not breathing properly, breathing through the mouth instead of the nose, because of the things that block the nose that are in the modern day diet then causes this misalignment of the jaw in children where it, it, it grows too thin and it's all to do with the airways and the sinus cavities being blocked and all kinds of stuff. I can't quite remember it enough to explain it properly. But that's the current understanding. But I do think Western Price was kind of right about the nutrients. It does make a difference as well. So I'm a big fan of vitamin K2. It is the only vitamin that, uh, it's the only fat-soluble vitamin that the toxic limit has not been found to it. Uh, so the general recommendation is like one or 200 microgram a day. But there was a study in Japan going on many years where they were giving people 45 milligrams a day. 
of a certain form of vitamin K2, the MK4 form, which is naturally found in animal foods. And there was only beneficial impact, pretty much no negative effects. So we can have a lot of vitamin K2, at least the MK4 type, and that's been proven to be extremely safe and beneficial. And they that was actually marketed as a pharmaceutical drug for um, reducing arterial plaque, that dosage of vitamin K2. So it has that dual benefit. It both pulls calcium out of places you don't want it, like plaque in your brain and in your arteries and kidney stones and all the rest of it. It pulls it out of where you don't want it, but it also puts it where you do want it, which is your bones and teeth. So uh, big fan of that. I would say, you know, it, consider having reasonably high doses of vitamin K2. Uh, many times you want to have it with D3, the type we sell is with uh, vitamin D3 as well. But, you know, I, I would... I would do blood tests before taking large amounts of vitamin D3. You don't have to do that with K2. So even if you're in a position, because I see this where people are like, oh, I don't need D3. My blood test said I don't need it. That's fine. Don't take it then. But have K2 probably still anyway. It's really, really beneficial. So Weston Price, yeah, he, he when he did his studies, K2 hadn't been discovered yet. But he was always looking for this missing ingredient that like he felt that there was this nutrient that hadn't been discovered yet, which was key to this. And it ended up being vitamin K2. And vitamin K2 is basically especially in fermented foods. Um, and if you have a really, really healthy gut microbiome, your gut will produce some of it itself. But again, most of us do not have a very healthy one. Um, and so, yeah, for, cheese is the most commonly eaten fermented food. But, you know, sauerkraut and famously natto, the fermented Japanese soy product, is like really high in vitamin, vitamin K2 as well. So... Uh, yeah, cheese has that benefit of being both high in calcium and vitamin K2. Um, and some people need more than others. Like in my genetic reports, it shows I have an elevated need for K2 and an elevated need for calcium. And I don't have cheese anymore for other reasons, uh, but I can see why I used to love it because it gave me these two nutrients that I really <laughs> needed. So now I just supplement with both and it's fine. I don't really, I don't feel that need for cheese anymore. But anyway, so K2, calcium, uh, magnesium. Oh yeah. So calcium, you can also supplement, right? There's calcium carbonate is okay, but I prefer like a, a, a calcium citrate ideally. Um, calcium citrate is one of the most alkalizing things you can take. Uh, it will, uh, the citrate is also alkalizing. So calcium citrate is pretty cool. You can also take uh, calcium lactate, uh, and even calcium hydroxyapatite. Um, I believe you can take the, the, bone and tooth form as well and of course if you want to go natural you can eat bone meal which is ground up bones if you don't want to have dairy that would be the other big calcium naturally source magnesium i've talked about many times before my favorite magnesium is magnesium glycinate one of the few things i seem to recommend in these podcasts that we actually sell when i feel younger so get it from us if you're going to get it um <laughs> but yeah it's the best absorbed form and i've tested that i've tested you know I've, i did an episode recently before and after test results and i finally managed to get my magnesium levels up to where they should be and it was by taking a lot of uh, magnesium glycinate so uh, that really does seem to be the best absorbed form. And glycine has loads of its own benefits as well that we, we've talked about in previous episodes. Um, so calcium, magnesium, boron is another one that is important for um, uh, uh, getting the calcium and magnesium in the bone to form correctly and the tooth as well. So uh, that's a mir mineral that you may want to consider supplementing if you don't get enough in your diet. Um, and then silica is one that some people talk about. This is much less mainstream, but some people say that silica is very supportive for the uh, health of the bones and teeth. And so uh, silica is not found that commonly in foods. There's certain foods that are high in it. Uh, okra is one of them. I think peppers, cucumbers, a few things like that. But some people like to, you know, supplement. Uh, I use this stuff called Biosil, which um, is like a liquid form that I add to my water because it, it basically makes anything added to kind of smooth taste. So Fiji water, one of the reasons that a lot of people like that is because it's high in silica. Um, it makes your water taste more smooth. And silica has a bunch of interesting properties that, you know, I don't, I'm not expert enough in, but I'd like to do an episode at one point with a, an expert on silica um, who can explain all the interesting things it can do. It can even help to detoxify certain toxins and stuff. So I always add silica to my water. Um for taste and health purposes. 
Um, and yeah, those are the main ones that I would really focus on for bone health. I just quickly want to talk about strontium. Sometimes they add strontium these days to bone health supplements and because they find it in bones. And my understanding is that's as absurd as adding lead to supplements because you sometimes find lead in bones. It's just a heavy metal. There's no evidence that it's actually essential for human health. Um, my understanding is it's, yeah, well-meaning companies are adding it because they think it may be strengthening bones a bit in the same way that fluoride strengthens teeth, but it's also a heavy metal, which is really not a good idea and has no actual you know, use in the body that has been proven. So I would not have bone health supplements with that in. Just wanted to uh, mention that as I think it's my be my first opportunity in these episodes. Um, so that's, uh, you know, supplement stroke food suggestions. Um, sugar, refined, you know, highly refined sugar is not doing your teeth any favors, even if you don't think it's so bad from other points of views. We debated that in a previous episode. I personally don't use any simple sugars, but I understand some who do who say that it's fine or even beneficial, but it's not beneficial for your teeth. So if you're going to have it, clean your teeth afterwards, <laughs> unless you have voluminous saliva with alkaline <laughs> minerals as i always keep saying uh, <laughs> smoking is just a bad idea that is smoking anything you know including cannabis cannabis is drying your mucous membranes it's oh, anything you smoke is you know carcinogenic it's 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 smoke in the end of the day it's going to have an impact on your circulation to some degree uh is it as bad as normal cigarettes sure pr maybe not in terms of uh, the impact on your teeth but it's not great either so just be aware of that if you're very concerned about tooth health uh, the, or oral health that smoking is going to counteract that vaping i've not seen the evidence on that because it's not actually smoke it's a vapor i think there's other reasons why vaping may not be a good idea but i haven't seen any evidence that it's necessarily directly bad for um uh, oral health um we talked about nose breathing that to breathe through the nose that's really really important that is kind of a, a thing that you want to keep being aware of and correcting yourself until it becomes a habit to breathe through your nose it worked for me it's now just what i do even as i said when i'm asleep so that means it must have become an unconscious habit uh, and that comes with just you know continually correcting yourself until it becomes normal I'd say the last one I will give is probably the most, um, the one that is the biggest topic that but I'll give the least information about. And that's just, if you have a different chronic disease state going on in your body, that's going to affect your immune system. It's going to, so it's going to reduce the effectiveness of your immune system. It's going to increase your tendency towards systemic chronic inflammation which will include your mouth your gums and it's going to um probably reduce the supply of saliva and alkaline minerals to keep your teeth uh, healthy and happy so while there is a lot of talk about you need to keep your mouth healthy because it can impact negatively the rest of your body the obverse is actually also true um if you have chronic digestive issues, sinus issues, urinary tract issues, even foot infection could be the opposite in the body, it doesn't matter. Any of these things that you have with chronic issues will also have an impact on your mouth. So if all you care about is, I don't know, how you look and that your teeth look nice when you smile, um, and otherwise you don't care about your health, uh, or just be aware that every aspect of the health of your body will negatively impact your oral health if if it is a chronic issue that is not resolved through the mechanism specifically of uh, chronic inflammation and i kind of mentioned this earlier in terms of eucharist but let me just say in general dealing with overcrowding of the teeth if you cannot clean in between t teeth with uh, any kind of brush then that means that there will be decay and infection and inflammation there so whether it's braces, Invisalign, if you even have to have teeth pulled. From my understanding and experience, it's worth it. Um, as a, It's a last resort, but it's it's preferable to having that tooth crowding, meaning you have that 
chronic inflammation. Fantastic. Beautiful list, Ellen. And now I'm going to be like, okay, I'm going to go out and do things that more than three times a day. I'm <laughs> really going to be making sure I'm phoning my kids. Hey, have you flossed today? Have you done, you know, have you done all the things that you need to do to keep them on top of it now? Which I'll be like, yeah, mom, but I doubt they will. <laughs> <But> <laughs> Don't floss. Start you young. <laughs> Not floss. I, it's inter, uh, sorry, the in, it's yeah, the, um, it, but but it's a distinction. Like the interdental brushes are uh, kind of annoying when you first start, but I actually think they're better. Like flossing is like it's kind of a weird thing. It's because it's kind of cutting, right? Yeah. It's it's no, this I little prefer, thing. I do prefer those little brushes because I I I've, I've got both, you know, depending. But mm -hmm. every time after I've flossed, it's almost because I've got quite tight teeth, as we discussed. You know, spacing mm -hmm. was a thing for me, and it's almost like it's going up there, and it's like almost injuring a little bit instead mm. of doing part of the job that it should do so no i really do like those those brushes a lot and again like as i said your teeth should be your gums should be as tough as the soles of your feet so the the, the floss shouldn't be able to damage it but the reality of course is the reality and so not only are the incidental brushes more effective but they're also as you say less you know jarring they're not like stabbing the sensitive area yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, thank you very much for that list. I mean, I, I know it's it's quite, you've given us a lot to look at. I mean, are there any final thoughts or last little words of wisdom you want to impart to all of us before we close? Yeah, I want to be honest and say, I don't know what I don't know. So if there's someone watching this who's like, nonsense, it is possible to uh, have the, the uh, bone grow back or whatever. I'd love to hear about it. I'm open, right? This is as far as I have got. This is the conclusions that I've come. As I said, for once, maybe I'm, a lot of this video is actually fairly close to the mainstream version, but it's kind of the cutting edge mainstream. I wanted to share this because I saw a lot of dentists who didn't understand any of this before I eventually managed to find some who did. Uh, but as I say, it's not really disputed. Um, oh, one thing I didn't mention is like, again, if you have the situation, um, I talked about daily hygiene, but you should see a hygienist as well. Again, if you have great non-crowded teeth, no inflammation, good alkaline minerals, you don't need to see a hygienist. But if you're in that position that you and I are in and many, many, many people are in, in fact, the vast majority of people are in, I think the estimate is that, you know, over 90% of people have some kind of uh, infection in their gums. So the vast majority of people uh, could really do with seeing a hygienist. Uh, regularly a good hygienist so i will say that but yeah uh, back to my original point if you know i'm always open to being educated so if anything i said you believe is a false limiting belief and you have real evidence not some guy said so some some lady said so but you know you have had the personal experience or you've seen genuine evidence that it's possible for teeth to regrow and not just enamel or for bone to regrow then uh, I'm all ears. I'd love to see it. Beautiful. Thank you. So yeah, please, everyone, you know, share in the comments, tell us your thoughts and, uh, you know, we'll look into it for sure and we'll, we'll bring you more on it. So again, thank you all for joining us. It's been our pleasure. And remember to hit the subscribe button and the bell icon so you don't miss an episode and we will see you next time. I hope you enjoyed that episode. And if you did, I want to tell you about a way that you can support the podcast while also getting great deals on high quality supplements that Ellen and I personally use, and that's Feel Younger. What I love about Feel Younger is that they have great quality products with minimal fillers at a very affordable price. You can call their customer support team 20 hours a day, seven days a week, and in my experience, they're very helpful and friendly. And the thing I love most of all is the amazing descriptions that Elwin has written about each product category on that topic. And each product has so much education on it that I've actually learned more from reading the descriptions than I have from a lot of articles. So to support the podcast, please use Feel Younger for all your supplement needs. And to let them know we sent you, use promo code RejuvenateMe for 20% off your first order at feelyounger.net. That's 20% off your first order using promo code RejuvenateMe at feelyounger.net.